Baylor begins uh, <clears throat> by saying that the means whereby to identify dead forms is mathematical law, whereas the means whereby to understand living forms is analogy. And his whole principle is going to be to favor the method of analogy, uh, which he is borrowing from the biological sciences and transposing into the, the world of history. He regards them as, since he regards history as something that's living, that has its own organic life, he doesn't see any problem, and he's been criticized for this, but he doesn't see any problem in borrowing basic methodology from uh, comparative morphology, the, the zoological <coughs> comparative morphology of the early 19th century and the late 18th century, and applying it to history. He's the first to do this. He's borrowed the method from Goethe. Goethe used it uh, to understand, uh, he had a plant theory of the metamorphosis of plants in which he said that, uh, for example, that um, every aspect of a plant that you look at uh, is to be understood as a transformation of the one idea, its sort of platonic idea, that uh, is the leaf. Uh, you open an orange, for example, and what are you looking at? You're looking at a collection of transformed leaves on the inside of the orange. Every part of the plant is a transformed leaf. And Goethe furthermore had this model for the ideal plant, the platonic plant, that goes through a series of distinct stages of contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion, uh, until the production of the flower and then the stamens and corolla which produce the, the next generation of the plant and it's a cycle. Spangler borrows that model and applies it to the model of culture. So he's borrowing from the principle of analogy uh, that he means to oppose here to mathematical law is borrowed from this, uh, from the biology and uh, the zoology uh, and the, the basic vitalism of biology of the early 19th century. He also borrows the principle, at first he's going to in the next couple of pages, he's, he's going to mention that uh, he has a series of polarities, but they're all the same polarity, just put differently every time, so that mathematical law versus analogy will become the world as nature versus the world as history. That's what he's going to say. Is his basic, and he's going to privilege, of course, the world as history, not the world as nature. By the world as nature, he means the nature in the sense in which science means nature, which is the type of nature that Heidegger criticized Western science for representing. That is to say, uh, a nature that is de-worlded and transformed into a pure abstract mathematical phase space, which is characterized by a world of immutable, unchanging laws that basically, as Heidegger puts it, de-worlds the real world by divorcing these phenomena and putting them into pure theoretical phase spaces. It's entirely artificial. It's a world of, of laws. And Spangler's going to say, this is the same mentality as the priests and the ancient religions, and it carries on down into the mentality of the scientists. Uh, the formulae and magical rites of the priest become, in modern science, the manipulation of the equations, but it's still the same kind of what he calls a spatial mentality because in that world of mathematical truths and laws, nothing ever changes. It's like Plato's divorce of being from becoming uh, that Heidegger saw as representing the beginning of the fall of philosophy. Um, whereas the world of uh, the world of history is the world of, as it sounds, of historical forms, but these historical forms for Spengler are concrete, that they're embedded in uh, biological processes, and they unfold over time. They have distinct life cycles with dis distinct stages, and he's going to say that civilization itself unfolds just like a gigantic organism with an early phase, a late phase, a, a climax, a budding, and then a disintegration, and it's all organic. It's predetermined, just as predetermined as the life cycle of any animal or plant is predetermined. And when he makes this statement in the first sentence where he says that in this book is attempted for the first time the venture of predetermining history, well, you can predetermine the history of any living thing by saying that it will grow old and die. I can say that I will grow old and die, or at least that I will die, and I have therefore predicted history. I've predicted my own history because all biological organisms grow old and die. That is morphologically certain. And so based on that, and based on the fact that certain things will happen to the body, let's say the human body, over time, and it's the same for everybody, you hit 40, certain things start to happen and go wrong. Uh, by the time you're 80, you're, you're shriveled and have arthritis and all kinds of health problems. It's the same for everyone. And so for Spangler, Modeling civilization on this biological organic model allows him to predict its history in the same way that you can say that certain morphological traits and biological phenomena will happen to organisms as they age. Uh, so by, by predicting, that's what he means. He's drawing 
from that model. So this is history versus nature, the world as, as nature versus history. So what he does then is he moves into this idea by history now. He wants to qualify what he means. And he says that moving into the world of history, uh, we Westerners, we Western Europeans tend to use the word history uh, in a way that is naively objective. We think uh, that our picture of history, uh, which unfolds over you know, thousands of years and then geologically over millions of years, is objective. Spangler's going to say it isn't objective. It's a projection onto the world of the way that the West makes sense out of things, just as each one of the other civilizations have done the same thing. For example, he says, our way of understanding history would never have occurred to a man of the classical civilization, and by classical he means Greek and Roman, would never have occurred to a man of the classical civilization for whom uh, the emphasis was on the present. History was largely dissolved and forgotten about as it happened and disappeared into the realm of ancient myth. Um, <clears throat> most, he says, if you look at the historians, if you look at Herodotus and, and Thucydides, these men were, <clears throat> were not writing about ancient history. They were writing about the history of events in which they themselves participated. Uh, and this is true all the way down to Tacitus, from, from Herodotus to, to Tacitus, the ancient past in these men's minds, which is simply the centuries before the time in which they lived, already for Polybius, for example, the first Punic War is, begin, is beginning to become vague. He's the great historian of the second Punic War, uh, is beginning to become vague and sketchy. And so uh, history dissolves into myth, and there's, there's a tendency, because this is an ahistoric civilization, by contrast to Western Europe, this is an ahistoric civilization, and it tends to be absorbed, the past tends to be identified more and more with mythical archetypes. And the present is just this narrow mode, this purely present mode that is now for the classical civilization and that is all that matter. He says if you look at the, for example, at the, the evolution of uh, the characters of the uh, classical drama from, uh, let's say, Aeschylus down to Seneca, it's the same characters. That's a thousand years almost of literary evolution and Seneca is still writing about Orestes and Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, just as Aeschylus was. So there's not much that's changed there. The, the, the forms don't evolve much over time, the way our characters do. For example, we move from Parzival and Tristan to Hamlet to Don Quixote, uh, all the way down to you know, Michael Corleone and Luke Skywalker. There's, there's been a, quite an evolution of, of distinct characters and distinct epochs with dis distinct ideas. Ours is a, is a very intensely historically oriented culture. And then he says, so that the Greeks um, didn't think of history the way we, we think of history. For them, it, any century before the time in which the historian lived is, is largely a realm of myth, that they didn't bother too much with concerning themselves. The Greek collector, the Pausanias, uh, the Galen, uh, the Greek collector is somebody who just collected objects and they just sat around, and he didn't bother to find out where they came from. He didn't bother to apply a scientific method to them to, to try to determine you know, what historical, they just weren't, there, there wasn't any anxiety about assigning specific exact dates to things in the classical mentality. So it has an ahistoric kind of mentality. He says this is nothing compared to the Hindu mentality. Um, he says contrast for that, he says contrast uh, to the classical mentality, the Egyptian mentality, the Egyptians forgot nothing. Whereas the Hindu civilization forgot everything, and classical civilization forgot most things, the Egyptian civilization forgot nothing. They remembered every single date, every single dynasty, every single person who ever ruled. And consistent with that, they invented the autobiography and they invented uh, the art of portrait, uh, the, the portrait statue, uh, the biographically real individual who did actually live, uh, who is also absorbed into the myth, in mythic archetypes of Osiris and Ra and so forth. But there is an intense historical consciousness uh, amongst the Egyptians uh, that we don't find uh, and, and tell our Western European civilization. For India, on the other hand, um, they are the civilization that is just as ahistorical as you can possibly push it. They had no historians, for the most part. Uh, the only historian I know of is Kalana, who writes a history of Kashmir. That isn't until the 12th century AD, though. And Egypt just for, or India rather, just forgot everything. And as a result of that, what we have is this vast anonymous body of texts. The Mahabharata is this huge sprawling epic. We don't know who wrote it. Um, there's a tradition of authors assigned to these texts, but that's largely a matter of convention. These texts were amorphous and anonymous. 
uh, pundits and, and Brahmins came along and inserted bits and pieces of things wherever they wanted to, so that what we have is this vast anonymous oeuvre in, uh, in Indian civilization. By contrast, for example, Spengler says with the Western texts where each bit of Western philosophy is associated with a very specific, definite personage. So likewise, he says that with respect to the burial of the dead in each of these civilizations too, the, the type of uh, way in which each society disposes of the dead is consistent with its own cultural mentality. For example, mummification is consistent with the Egyptian will to not forget, to preserve as long as possible the actual historical reality of the individual to the point where the mummies that we have, many of them actually have recognizable features that Egyptologists can actually recognize. So there's a will into a will to duration of the temporal into the eternal that is evident in the Egyptian consciousness that just wasn't there in classical civilization. And in fact, with classical civilization, we get the practice of burning the dead, which begins to come in after the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans didn't practice it. Uh, they had reliquary mounds, and they preserved uh, the dead body. It had a very strong relationship to the underworld and the afterlife. But long about 1200 BC, with the Dorian migrations, they bring in ironworking, and they also bring in the cult of the burning of the dead, which indicates, as Ervin Rhoda points out in his book on Psyche, which indicates a weakening of ties with the underworld. Burning the, the body, uh, for Spangler, uh, indicates a, a lack of thrust of historical consciousness into the future, a forgetting of the dead, but also a weakening of ties to the underworld, as far as Ervin Rhoda, Nietzsche's friend, was concerned. Um, <clears throat> so in both in Vedic India and in, um, in the case of the Greeks, there was this practice of, of burning the dead, mummification in Egypt. So each of these cultures has these idea systems that are all internally consistent if you examine them closely and carefully enough. So then <clears throat> what he wants to do is he moves into... Uh, in the next part of the introduction here, he moves into his critique of this ancient medieval modern scheme that Vadimo had talked about as characteristic of modernity, um, and which Spengler himself had already let go of, but which Heidegger, on the other hand, who's the great hero, uh, certainly of Vadimo and, and a lot of Derrida, a lot of postmodern thinkers, Heidegger is the great hero, and yet Heidegger was even more bound to this unilinear scheme of ancient medieval modern than Spengler, who had already let go of it and surpassed it and moved on into a more postmodern type of consciousness, Heidegger's understanding of the various epochs of being does indeed move from the Greek understanding of being to the medieval understanding of being to the modern understanding of being. It, his, it, he, there is no talk of the Egyptian understanding of being or the Indian understanding of being, nothing of that in Heidegger. So he himself remained captured by this ancient medieval modern schema and that, uh, and yet, postmodern philosophers just you know, worship Heidegger, of course, as a, as, a, as a god, the philosophical god who announced the end of metaphysics, and therefore the relativity of thought systems. But Spangler, though he doesn't announce the end of metaphysics, his approach is eminently metaphysical, and he loves metaphysics, uh, will give us what Heidegger doesn't, the understanding of being in each of the different cultures. Heidegger read Spangler uh, early on, and just as he was starting out, and I think Spangler's understanding of being and how each culture has a different Dasein, a different understanding of being, influenced Heidegger's idea of Dasein, of both Dasein and Sein, actually. Um, <clears throat> so he moves into now a criticism of this idea of this schema, uh, ancient, medieval, modern, and how this has been the bias, the prejudice that the West brings with it to its understanding of history. And that includes its scientific models, the distinction into Paleolithic, Neolithic Bronze Age, this, this bears the ghost of this ancient medieval modern schema. Um, you know, the age of Adam simply becomes the age of the caveman, uh, the Neolithic, the age of the village, and so forth. All this carries on into even the scientific understanding uh, of the unfolding of history. And so, um, <clears throat> pause here for a second. <clears throat> 